the next lecture is talking about uh, a precious resource, the liquid of life, water. And I'm pleased to, to invite Professor Uri Shamir. Uri Shamir is a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. He's the founder of, uh, founding director of the Stefan and Nancy Grand Water Research Institute at the Technion, uh, a senior consultant to the Israeli Water Authority. Professor, uh, Professor Shamir is a renowned scientist and is counted among the top international expert and consultant in hydrology and management of water resources systems. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, foreign member of the Spanish Academy of uh, Science, honorary member of the Israel Water Resources Association. He is a recipient of the 2000 International Hydrology Prize awarded by the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, UNESCO, and uh, the World Meteorological Organization, a recipient of the 2003 Julian Heinz Award for significant contributions to water resources management uh, from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Professor Shamir will speak to us on the issue of management of, water se of the water sector under condition of scarcity. Professor Shamir, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I will try to dispel some of the things that were said earlier, and then maybe during the discussion uh, we will get back to that. I will also add that I'm a member of the Israeli negotiating team on water, but I've excluded completely mention of the situation with our neighbors, given that uh, all the time I have is three hours. Um, I will not touch upon that, but maybe during the discussion if you're interested. But I what I will try to do is give you a glimpse on the water situation, some basic information, how challenges created pressures, how challenges met with responses, the main failures and accomplishments over time, the new 2012 master plan, and the question, I'll try to answer the question, can we cope with the forecasted population increase, and in parentheses, climate change, because I think that that threat of climate change in the case of water is less than what it is purported to be, and I will offer you as uh, an answer to uh, my question, can we cope? Yes. That is what I propose to show you, and I also claim that it can be done with acceptable cost, although I will not touch upon the cost, and not only financial. Environmental, social, political, whatever it is, there are costs associated with what you want to do, but I think that this uh, can be done with moderate or acceptable cost, given that there is going to be a population change in the area. And when I talk about our situations, similar situations exist or will arise or do arise in other parts of the world. And I think that some of the things, Professor Ehrlich, that we have been doing here could be used as examples, provided they are adjusted to the local circumstances, conditions, whether they are geographic, hydrological, social, economic, whatever it is. You can see some of the things we have done that should not be done, but can you also see some of the things that could be done elsewhere. To remind us, this is our area here that ranges between something like 1,000 millimeters a year, which is quite a bit, all the way to about zero in the south and in the center of the country, and that includes last weekend's uh, rainfall, although it was quite significant. We are still not moving away from that. The forecast is the first three months of this uh, winter are going to be plentiful. Uh, the rest of the time, probably less so. So don't move away yet from our basic uh, tenet of saving water. On the right-hand side, we see the nine different water sources. The only one that is a surface source is the Kinneret watershed and the lake itself. All the others are aquifers, some of them flowing eastward towards the Jordan River, these include these, and some flowing to the west, including the western Galilee, Carmel, the coastal aquifer, and the western part of the, uh, the mountain aquifer. You see, therefore, on the right-hand side, something that amounts to an average of 1,200 million cubic meters a year. 
and 1,700 over the whole area, because I did draw it without any borders, without geographical borders, in the part that is controlled by Israel, will probably be controlled by Israel, a number like 1,200 million cubic meters. If you want to keep that in mind, you'll see everything relates to that. On the left-hand side, you see one of the achievements. There is a highly integrated national and regional system that started at the Sea of Galilee, goes all the way down, but all of these regional systems make it possible to move water around from where it is or can be produced, like now with the desalination plants I'll show you in a minute, or a bit later, and therefore we have tremendous flexibility, although the system needs to be upgraded to meet the new demand. I use numbers, oh, sorry about that, I'll go back. I use numbers from the Central Bureau of Statistics, and uh, the numbers that I saw on the board do not coincide with that. I'm sorry, I should have used my own clicker, and I will try to be very careful about not doing this again. Okay, so the number that we have as an average forecast for the year 2050, which will be the year for planning, is about 14 million. And the total amount of water that I showed you before, the 1,200, if you divide that into the current population, these are by the way the unaccounted for ones that are not registered and appear in different forms. So we're at about 8 million. Uh, the number I showed you before translates into something like 150 cubic meters per capita per year, which is much below what is considered in the international arena as being an adequate number, and we're surviving with that. And it will go down to something in the order of 90 when we get to 14 million, but the Bureau of Statistics says that the number is going to be anywhere between 11 and 16. These are the numbers as of yesterday from the, or a week ago from the Central Bureau of Standards, and this is what we use in our planning process. The total area is about 21,000 square kilometers. The irrigated area is about 10% of that, about 2,000 square kilometers. Beginning with the precipitation, we compute something called a drought index. Any area here that is red means that over a period of several years, the precipitation was lower than the average. And it's counted in the number of standard deviations around it, but you can see quite clearly that when the national water system was completed, already before that we had times when there was a very low flow, and I will concentrate later on on where we are today. And this SPI, the, the index, is also going down with time, probably a sign either of climate change or other things as well. If we look at the amount of water that exists in all of our sources over time, in the numbers I showed you before that the average was something like 1,200, which is down here, this is historical. And you can see that in the period 73 to 92, the average was 1,800. In the more recent period of 93 to 2009, it's down to by 200 million. For the entire period, it's something in the order of 17, but the standard deviation all along is something like a third of the average. And that is a very important point when you are to manage a water resources system. Because, like in your bank account, it's the times when you don't have enough that you have to plan for. And I will show you this very figure later on. And this is for all the sources between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. So that does include all of the Palestinian territories. It does include water that comes from the Golan Heights, but it did flow originally there. So the question where the border is, is moot at this point in time. The cumulative deficit over this period here is in the order of one average, the 1,700 I showed you before, and the second cumulative deficit is about 1,500, and we're still not out of it. We're just getting out of it with last year's uh, water. Where does this lead us in, into the future? Well, there are tremendous sources of uncertainty. You saw that in my first slide, I added to the word scarcity the question of uncertainty, which is a strong determinant on how you manage a water resource. And the sources of uncertainty are population, the demands, the hydrology, the performance of system components, costs and benefits, pricing, laws, regulation, politics. Yes, this is one of the greatest sources of uncertainty. 
and international conditions, in other words, our obligations, the desired outcomes are to supply reliably water quantity and quality, serve people, agriculture, protect species, do this with efficiency, income is an important point and with net benefit, but there are some negative outcomes, such as loss of service when system components go out, shortages, loss of species, financial losses, loss of professional reputation for people like myself, and loss of political position, no less important. In other words, we are, as professionals, under attack. The next time an attack is going to come is when some of the desalination plants are going to stop working. They are designed to be able to overcome those shortages, but they are not necessarily going to operate all the time. And since public and politicians have a very short sight, we are going to be criticized if these plants don't operate continuously. And that's forecasting. The challenges that create pressures, the large hydrological variability that I showed you, possible impact of climate change, frequent change in Israeli politics and replacement of ministers, uncertainty in the political and management domain can be the most difficult to deal with, and obviously the regional issues. In the past, about 70% and more of the fresh water was used by the politically powerful agricultural sector. As long as water for agriculture was subsidized, being subsidized, the Ministry of Treasury refused to allow desalination. They said, take a cubic meter away from agriculture, give it to the cities, and don't subsidize. That has changed substantially. But as the population grew, the urban demand for more portable water became evident, and now more than 50% of the natural water goes to agriculture, and that will now include also the artificial water. The result was overuse of the resources. In other words, declining water levels and qualities in the sources caused by human activities and lower water levels. Rising quality standards, on the other hand, the, incre the water standards for potable water have been increasing, and I can assure you that there's safe water in our taps everywhere in the country. There is no need to go to other kinds of water. And also the standards for the treated wastewater because of environmental considerations and their use in agriculture are also an important thing. Water agreements with our neighbors and potential reduction of our share of the regional water resources. All of that appears already in the two agreements that we have with Jordan in 1994 with the Palestinians and interim agreement 1995. What, have we done, what has been done in response? Reduction of more than 60% of the fresh water supply to irrigation, and I will show you a graph in a minute. Replaced by sewage effluence and water productivity has multiplied many times at the same time. Pricing is moving towards full cost for all sectors, including agriculture, which was not the case in the past. Water conservation in the urban area is finally kicking in, just more recently than it should have, through pricing regulations, campaigns, and education. This is the sewage use in the country. We are first in the world with over 70% of the sewage being used, recycled for irrigation. Our next neighbor is Spain with 12. So that's a major achievement. Here is a graph taken from Yoav Kislev from the Hebrew University Faculty of Agriculture. And it shows you the per capita figures. In other words, this is the total divided by the number of people. And you can see that industry is roughly constant over time. Urban is reasonably constant until I show you the next graph. However, agriculture has gone down from about 500, cub uh, 500 cubic meters per capita per year to something in the order of 200. And that is due to productivity of agriculture moving away from some of the staple crops that we need to import, so it's not scot-free but we don't grow any cotton, for example, as a consequence of that. But look at this. This is the urban consumption, again in cubic meters per capita per year, so divided by the population. And there are three graphs here. The lower one is for private homes and gardens. The second one is everything used within the municipal area. And the third one is for all populated areas. In other words, that includes army camps and everything else. And you can see the numbers run with 60, 80, 100. But over time, more recently, there is a substantial reduction 
the numbers used to be 100 and more, and now the total is in the area of 90. And I'll show you another graph in a minute that will show you how this has been done. And again, you can see that the home and garden kept rather constant over a period from 96 until 2006 with... Okay. Look at this. This is just a total, that one that was at the top, the 100. And look what happens when the reduction in recent years was by 15 cubic meters per capita per year. The net result of that, if you take 14 million people by the year uh, that I showed you before, 2050, and you multiply this difference by that, you get about 200 million cubic meters a year potential reduction in water use due to more efficient, more effective use to a limit. In a country like ours, there is a big philosophical argument whether or not you should stop people or influence them to this extent or send them just a price signal and let them do what they want. I'm back to the same figure that I had before, but I added on the right-hand side the word desalination plants. Before, we had just this, and I'll show you what happened with desalination in this country. So I said that there was this amount of deficit. As a result of that, there was a government decision in 2001, 2000. Are we still okay, Abitale? Yes. Okay. Uh, on 400 million cubic meters a year. And then disaster hit. We had a very good year. As a consequence of that, the government reduced from 400 to 230. Immediately. That's called short-sightedness because the decision to go for this amount looked at the entire history and the rising demands with time with the population and concluded that we will not be able to sustain this. And since putting in place a desalination plan is something that takes 5 and 10 and 15 years. You have to start it early enough with anticipation. Okay? So this is the net result. And again, the cumulative deficit now has convinced the government to go back, and I'll show you to what? To 600, not 400. The 400 was the beginning. And what you really have to do is you have to look at the uncertainty associated with the fact that you have aquifers and the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, and that you have demands that are uncertain. All of the red figures here are random. And you want to create a desalination plant that supplements what you're getting here, and you have to plan it and design it, and then operate it over time to meet a certain prescribed level of reliability, which is a policy decision. This has been done in the new water plan, by using an aggregate uh, representation of the entire system, one bucket with inputs and outputs, but it's also supported by much more detailed models of this type, so it's not just a simplistic one. And the net result is the following. At the moment, we have three operating plants since 2006, 7, and 9 that supply together about 25% of the natural replenishment. It's about 300 million cubic meters a year. You remember the number 1,200 before. So this is about the, the number, and it's added on top. At the moment, two additional plants are under construction and will be operational in 2013, if they go well, and if not, in the beginning of 2014. And when you add those two, you get up to 50% of the 1,200 that I showed you before. Okay? We have also offered the Palestinians during the negotiations, we offered them to place in Hedera near this plant, a plant that they would build, construct, operate through a blind pipeline that will go to the West Bank, um, and that has not materialized. It. This is what a power, well, desalination plant looks like in Hedera, near the power plant. So the responses include desalination of something like 300 million cubic meters a year with going up to 550 to 600. On 750, there is already a government decision subject co to continuous reevaluation as we go along. We're not committing this. We're saying we need to prepare, and this is at the moment a government decision. Desalination of saline groundwater to the effect of about 50 million cubic meters a year, and the sewage is going from 300 million to about 500 million. The main failures in the past, overuse of the natural sources, quality deterioration in the sources, 
delayed decisions on large-scale desalination, too late attention to urban water conservation until quite recently, and governance of the national infrastructure, and I'm not sure whether Daniel was meaning that, but there is a great difficulty in managing jointly national infrastructure from electricity to water to gas to roads to everything else. Moving things around in this country lacks a governing entity at the top that will adjudicate or organize all of this, and therefore the water authority in Israel is really fighting a battle to get its place in the sun. But what are the main accomplishments? A strongly integrated national water policy and central control towards regulation. We are now moving into an era of regulation. Highly integrated water supply system, a very efficient use of water in agriculture. Now urban demand management has kicked in. Reuse of sewage effluents, large-scale seawater desalination and some desalination of brackish groundwater. There is a new master plan that has been approved by the board of the Israeli Water Authority. Its version 3 was approved in July 2011. Its updated version, after a lot of public debate and interaction with stakeholders, was passed by the board in August of this year, and it's being in preparation to be considered by the government through the minister. I won't I'll skip over this slide because it says how this has been done. There is a, an overall water balance, and the only interesting points are here on the right-hand side. The rest of it is important, but I can indicate to you that as far as the water sources are concerned, there is an increment here of the desalination and a supplement up to 750 that was decided upon. The supplement will get it up to 1300 approximately, and it meets the forecast of the demand in a base scenario that has then been randomized. The result looks like this. If we look from 2015 to 2050, which is the scope of the plan, at five-year intervals, we have a bunch of rectangles here that represent different required reliabilities of the supply. The higher the reliability, there is no such thing as 100%, but striving for 100% requires more desalination than the lower reliabilities, which are, for example, 75%. And we're forecasting something in the order of 1,500 to 1,700 million cubic meters a year to be desalinated in the year 2050. Why do we need this today? To plan for the placement of the plants. We had to go to the national authorities and forecast for them what the plan or what the map is going to look like. If this is done, then the storage in our reservoirs that have been depleted and are very low today they are about here, will rise and go a long time. If you have a high reliability requirement, like 100%, you will get more storage. You see it's about twice the average annual. And if it's lower, then it can go lower. There are many other things that have been done. Management of the Sea of Galilee and the watershed, in which we collaborate with Avital. Protection and sustainable management of groundwater gray water recycling, cloud seeding, effluence, advanced treatment to potable water quality, not necessarily for drinking, but it gets to that, stormwater runoff management, water sensitive urban planning, effects of climate change have to be taken into, consider into considerations. They are serious but less dramatic than the uh, increasing population. What's the take home message that I suggest to you? First of all, Israel can meet the water needs of the increasing population to 2050 and beyond at reasonable cost, although I didn't show you the cost. I don't have enough time to demonstrate what the costs are. Many places in the world are facing mounting water challenges, so our experience is relevant as an indication of what does and will happen, what can and what should be done, and what should be avoided. Because we are further ahead, we also know what the negative consequences are, so we can tell others don't repeat our mistakes. I talked about this to the then Palestinian water commissioner who wanted very much, much to emulate what we are doing here, and I said, please don't repeat the mistakes. 
And so some of the responses and solutions might be, and these solutions, as I said, have to be adapted to the local conditions. I do, I do uh, credits and thanks to the team with which I work at the Water Authority. Miki Zaide is the national planner, strategic planner, and we have four people on this team. These are the others. The directors of the Water Authority, Uri Shani and Alex Kushnil, and the board of the, of the authority, as well as the Minister of Water and Energy, Energy and Water, Uzi Landau. In the master plan, we have team leaders and many contributors, and data was derived from many sources. And I thank everybody here in the audience and the organizers and you, sir, for being with us today.